Sean Finnegan, and you are listening to Restitutio, a podcast that seeks to recover authentic Christianity and live it out today. Who was the original audience for the book of Genesis? Although we might be tempted to think we are and read Genesis as if it was written yesterday, Actually, it was written a long time ago in a different language and culture. And let's face it, Genesis is really important for building any kind of understanding of how science and scripture fit together. Thinking through who the audience was will help us approach the first chapter of Genesis on its own terms. In this episode, Will Barlow labors to put Genesis in its own context. He reminds us of what Israel had just been through in Egypt— prior to the writing of Genesis, as well as other creation accounts from the ancient Near East. His goal is simply to contextualize Genesis within its own time and place in order to help us avoid anachronism. Here now is episode 459, part two of our Scripture and Science class, Background on Genesis chapter 1 with Will Barlow. In this session, we're going to begin to dip our toes at least a little bit into Genesis chapter 1, which is, in my mind, the most important passage in Scripture where we can relate to what science says about our world. So I've titled it Background on Genesis 1. So in this session, we're going to spend a lot of time building an understanding of Genesis 1 and investigating various ways of interpreting Genesis 1. So that's going to be our, a lot of time in our class. We're going to spend doing those two things. In this particular session, we're going to be looking at the historical and cultural context behind the book of Genesis. And we're going to begin that by asking the same questions that we asked at the end of session 1, which is, what is our assumption about the Bible? That the Bible is about eternal truth. It's about wisdom. It's about a relationship with God and with the Lord Jesus Christ and with others. It is not a scientific textbook, nor was it ever meant to be a modern scientific textbook. So should we expect the Bible to speak accurately according to a modern view of science? And again, I think the answer has to be no. There's no way Moses would have had the right vocabulary or the people listening to these books would have had the right vocabulary uh, to understand our modern scientific truths. But should we expect the Bible to communicate eternal truth in a way that can be comprehended by an ancient culture uh, half the world away? Yes, I think it can be. We can expect the Bible to communicate eternal truth in a way that would have been understandable and intelligible to the ancient Hebrews. And then there should be wisdom that we can draw from this as well. Uh, Things that we can pull from these scriptures that will benefit our lives. With that in mind, we're going to begin to look at Genesis. The first question we have to ask ourselves about Genesis is, who wrote Genesis? Because if we answer the question of who wrote Genesis, that gives us a better window into the historical and cultural context of the original audience of the book of Genesis. Now, many scholars say that it was a mixture of writers over a long span of time, possibly a thousand years or so. The main theory behind this is called the documentary hypothesis, which has been in vogue for a little over a hundred years now. And the idea there is that there's at least four main sources for the material in Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, that there was a later editor or redactor, which most people point to Ezra for that role. And so some people say that it was a mixture of writers over a long span of time. I don't think that this is right. I don't think that the documentary hypothesis is correct. Um, I think it's perfectly possible that one person with the Spirit of God could have written Genesis through Deuteronomy. So I believe, as I put up here, that Moses wrote Genesis with the Spirit of God guiding him, of course. And so I think that shows us quite a bit about the historical context behind the book of Genesis. So how does this affect our reading? Well, if Moses wrote Genesis, along with the other first five books of the Bible, then we know a 40-year window of time when this could have happened. 
And essentially, it was between when Moses was 80 years old and when he died at 120 years old. So in that period of time, somewhere in that uh, timeline, is when he wrote the book of Genesis. So that gives us a very specific historical and biblical and linguistic context where we can, we can delve in and understand that context even greater by digging into it, understanding that. Now, I want to point out that even if we go with a documentary hypothesis, even if we say that it was a mixture of writers over a longer period of time, we're still talking about a culture and a language half the world away at least 2,500 years ago. So we're still going to be excluding modern science and modern scientific uh, vocabulary from our understanding, read, our initial reading of Genesis 1 and the rest of Genesis. Moving forward, uh, assuming that Moses is the one who wrote Genesis, let's trace back through some of the details surrounding this 40-year period. We've talked a little bit about what was not in the thought mind of the people who would have been the initial audience of Genesis. We said, it's not going to be modern astronomy, modern physics. We're going to try to replace that with something that's more tangible. Instead of just saying what it's not, let's take some time and build up what it really is. What is in the minds of these people as they're in the wilderness, they're being led around by Moses, and Moses is writing down this scripture. What's in their minds? What are the questions that they have? What are the or the burning things in the back of their mind that they want to get addressed? And what kind of questions then should we expect Genesis to answer as a result? Building up to how did Israel end up in Egypt? Well, just going briefly over the story of Joseph. Uh, Joseph was one of the children of Israel. He gets sold into slavery. Uh, eventually, uh, he gets thrown in prison. And then after being in prison for a period of time, he gets called out of prison to interpret a dream for Pharaoh. Uh, by the power of God, he interprets that dream. He eventually gets exalted to be second in command of all of Egypt. And through that, he's able to provide food for not just Egypt, but also for a lot of the inhabited regions surrounding Egypt, which included his family, which lived in Canaan at that time. So eventually his family comes down and, and semi-permanently relocates to Egypt. After some time passed, we see in Exodus chapter 1. If you want to follow along with me, I'll be in Exodus chapter 1, verse 8. I'm reading from the ESV. Now there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. And he said to his people, Behold, the people of Israel are too many and too mighty for us. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, lest they multiply, and if war breaks out, they join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. A period of time passed, and it's into this environment where Moses is born. Moses is born into a society that had been in slavery, been enslaved for multiple generations. There had been a, a lot of suffering, a lot of physical forced labor that had to be done, a lot of injustices that were done. In fact, by the time that Moses is born, there is a standing order for all male Hebrew children to be killed upon birth. And so it's just horrific to think about the kind of trauma, the kind of abuse that went on in this society. This is right around the time that Moses was born. So Moses is born. Of course, his parents are not going to comply with the order to kill him. The people that were meant to enforce that rule don't get there in time. And eventually, Moses' parents put him into a basket and send him down the river. It seems like a remarkable step to take. but They felt like that's what they needed to do to save their baby boy. His older sister followed along on the bank and followed him. He ends up drifting right in front of the daughter of Pharaoh. And she pulls him out and decides she wants to adopt him. And because his sister is right there, she says, hey, I know a woman. She can take care of this baby for you. And so he ends up going back home with his parents, with his family, and gets to spend a, a few years there under the tutelage of his parents, learning. And he would have learned a little bit about who he was, from this oral tradition about Abraham and the people that came before. That's all they had at that point was oral tradition. So he would have learned a little bit about who he was, who his people were before they were enslaved. And we can see that this had an impact in his life later on. 40 years later, at age 40, Moses stumbles upon 
an Egyptian man arguing with a Hebrew man. And he decides to take matters into his own hands. And he kills the Egyptian and buries him right there in the sand. And as what happens when you do something drastic like that, you commit murder, uh, you end up on the run. You have to skip town. So things got too hot for Moses. He ends up having to leave town. And he ends up in Midian. And for the next 40 years, he lives essentially a normal life. He marries. He has kids. He raises a family. He raises some flocks just out in the wilderness. He's just sort of an average guy out in the wilderness. And that's where we pick up the story of Moses in Exodus chapter 3. We're going to read quite a bit of Exodus chapter 3 because this is a turning point in Moses' life. And it helps also to explain a little bit about uh, what the Israelites were thinking and feeling during this period of time. So again, I'm going to read Exodus chapter 3, which is the burning bush account. This is where God calls Moses. Now Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. And he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. He looked and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. And Moses said, I will turn aside to see this great sight. Why the bush is not burned. When the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Then he said, do not come near. Take your sandals off your feet for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. And he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings and I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey to the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites and the Jebusites. And now behold, the cry of the people of Israel has come to me and I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. Come, I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? He said, But I will be with you, and this shall be the sign for you that I have sent you when you have brought the people out of Egypt. You shall serve God on this mountain. Then Moses said to God, If I come to the people of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, say to this people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say this to the people of Israel, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. Go and gather the elders of Israel together and say to them, The Lord, Yahweh, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob, has appeared to me, saying, I have observed you and what has been done to you in Egypt. And I promise that I will bring you up out of the affliction of Egypt to the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, a land flowing with milk and honey. So here we see God's call to Moses at age 80, and we see uh, this miraculous event. And what does God acknowledge about the children of Israel on multiple occasions? That he has heard their afflictions, he has seen the trauma that they're going through, he's heard their cries for help, that he's sending someone to deliver them. And these people were people that were familiar with trauma, and they needed deliverance. They needed God's help. They needed uh, a savior, a Messiah. And they got one. They got a savior in Moses. That's who God sent. So after this, eventually uh, Moses agrees. After going back and forth with God a little bit about how well he could speak and a couple of other issues, they make some arrangements. And with a promise that Aaron's going to help him and that he's going to have other people alongside him, uh, they decide Uh, that it's time for him to go to Egypt uh, where he was last seen as a murderer and go to talk to Pharaoh. 
that's what happens. Moses goes to Egypt. He talks to Pharaoh. Uh, Pharaoh relents. Then he doesn't. He goes back and forth. Plagues come and go, which we'll talk about a little bit more in a future session. We'll talk about uh, the plagues in a lot more detail. So I'm going to gloss over it really quickly at this point. Plagues come and go. And eventually Pharaoh says, yep, you can go. Uh, this happens after the plague of the firstborn, which happens the night after the Passover, the first Passover. So the Hebrews leave. Uh, they take a lot of the wealth of Egypt with them. And on their way out of town, Pharaoh decides to change his mind. So the people of Israel are heading towards the Red or Reed Sea, depending on which translation you like. They're heading toward the sea. So in front of them, all they've got is sea. Behind them, they've got the approaching Egyptian army. Seems like a dead end. What takes place there is one of the most compelling, miraculous events in the Old Testament. God uses wind and he opens up a channel and they cross on dry land, the children of Israel. When the Egyptians come to follow them, the waters come back and the Egyptians are destroyed. So these people have seen the pillar of cloud, the pillar of fire. They've witnessed a miraculous crossing of a body of water with an army approaching them from behind. But that's still not enough for them to overcome years and years of trauma in their own mind, this sort of slavery mindset that they must have had built up over time. So even though God gives them water miraculously out of a rock, he gives them food, he gives them manna and quail, this is what their response is. Periodically, in Exodus 17, verse 3, it says, But the people thirsted there for water, and the people grumbled against Moses and said, Why did you bring us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? See, for them, going back to the comforts of slavery seemed better in the moment than freedom that was being supported by God's continual involvement. So this is, this is part of their mindset, that they're having a hard time getting past this trauma, this situation where they felt somewhat safe, even though they were slaves. Later in the book of Numbers, it says in verse 20, chapter 21, verse 5, And the people spoke against God and against Moses, Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we loathe this worthless food. So first they say there's no food, and then they say, Oh, we loathe this worthless food. <laughs> so they had food, they just thought it was worthless. Well, you know, this type of complaining, this type of being upset with Moses and with God, it may seem difficult for us to understand because we're reading these pages, we're seeing how God is delivering them, but we also didn't experience the hundreds of years that happened before this. The hundreds of years of watching as friends and family members were beaten, punished, uh, were asked to do forced labor, or had children taken from them and murdered. Uh, it's just devastating to think about the background, what was going on in their minds throughout this whole process. It's hard for people that have gone through trauma like that to feel safe. It's hard for them to feel like uh, life is going the right direction. And so this is the background in which we find uh, the children of Israel as we head into this 40 year wilderness period where Moses wrote the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. So who was the original audience of the book of Genesis? Well, it's the very people we just read about. The very people who grumbled and complained to Moses, many of them would have been illiterate, but they would have been the initial listeners of the book of Genesis. These people had a slave mentality, and how could they not? They had just gone through generations of slavery in Egypt. A powerful experience, not something you quickly heal from. And this point is something we haven't really mentioned before, but I think it's really important. We talked a little bit about how Moses' parents would have had an oral tradition, something to teach Moses in those early formative years before he was in the court of Egypt and was trained, classically trained, and during that training would have learned to write, which is how we believe he was able to write the books of the Pentateuch. But instead of having worship of Yahweh being front and center for that entire period of time, they were inundated in one of the most idolatrous ancient societies. So many gods, uh, so little time, 
<laughs> and <laughs> the idolatry was just rampant. And so you think about this, you've got a group of people that have been abused. They've seen horrible, horrible things happen to them and the, their family, their friends. They've been uh, forced into labor for years and years and years. Uh, they're dealing with trauma. And then on top of that, their, their biggest experience with religion for the last couple hundred years, the most visible experience with religion that they have around them is this pagan idolatrous culture. That's the, the historical context behind the book of Genesis. So as we approach the book of Genesis, as we think about what was in their thoughts, what was in their thought life, the thought world of the people who were the, were the initial audience of Genesis, particularly Genesis chapter one, we're focusing in on here in this class. This is not a group of people who are concerned about astrophysics. This is not a group of people that was necessarily interested in evolution. These are far beyond their time, far beyond what they were thinking about. I really enjoyed this quote. I recently read a book called How Not to Read the Bible by Dan Kimball. And on page 166, this is what he says about the background of the book of Genesis. He says, Genesis was written to the Israelites after they had lived in a land that worshiped many gods to remind them of who the one true God was, not to explain the science and details of creation. Again, people, were, they were traumatized. They lived in a pagan environment. That's what was in their background of their mind. It wasn't 6,000 years or 13 billion years. It wasn't any other of the questions that we ask about Genesis 1. So now these are not inspired, God-inspired questions. We don't have an official record of exactly what was in the background of the minds of the people of Israel as they're in the wilderness listening to the book of Genesis being read to them. But here are some things that might have been on their mind, some questions that might have been on their mind that can be useful for us in thinking about the book of Genesis. How about this one? Are we going to survive here in the desert? Are we safe here? Pretty powerful. Is there really only one God? What about all the Egyptian gods? Are they angry we left Egypt? It's a big, big question. Is this God who rescued us still here or are we alone? You know, there's a lot of amazing things that happened early on in the Exodus. They saw the pillar of fire, the pillar of smoke, had the Red Sea crossing. But then at some point, it's just like the manna. Like they're just traveling around. It's just the manna. <laughs> so they could have gotten past the idea that God's presence was with them. At some point, it would have been easier for them to forget that. What do we have to do to please this one God so we will have crops that won't fail and have food for our families? And this is a common thing we can see historically is that many cultures, many of the ancient gods, it seems like a lot of the people were just trying to placate those gods so they would have good crops, they'd have water, they'd have the basics of life. People thought that uh, by placating these gods, they could have the things that they need. So that's a similar question that they might've been asking. How about, should we worship the sun or should we worship the moon like the Egyptians? Or should we worship like the Canaanites who are now nearby? Who should we worship? Finally, is the Egyptian story of how the world, how the world was made the true one? And these are all again from page 168 of How Not to Read the Bible by Dan Kimball. Thought they were interesting questions. On this last one, I think the point is important that these people, the people of Israel in the wilderness, they already had a creation myth in the back of their mind. The Egyptian one. That's the one that was around them, that they had heard about, that they had seen being talked about. And so that's the context we find people in, these people in. I want to take a little bit of time and I'm not going to do a lot on this, but I want to just briefly compare and contrast Genesis 1 with uh, some of the other creation myths that were available at that time. I'm not going to go into detail on those creation myths. You can do a search. There's lots of great resources, including the Bible Project it has some great resources on that. So if you want to know more about the Egyptian myth, the Babylonian myths, the other ancient uh, creation myths, I'd, you know, knock yourself out. We don't have time in the class to cover those comprehensively. But I do want to mention a couple things here. When we contrast Genesis 1 with the other accounts, we have a single God. 
as opposed to a pantheon of gods or gods and then created beings that sort of do the gods bidding. Okay, so you have a single God. That single God creates by himself using a word, not again, other created beings or minions to do all the little busy work of creation. The Hebrew God creates everything himself. Another thing is how that God views people. Uh, in Genesis 1, we see God creating humans with love and care. Uh, you don't get that in the other stories. You just don't. Another one here is a God that views humans as more than servants. In a lot of the other myths, you get humans taking a very subservient role to the gods. And in Genesis, what we see is a God who's going to hand over dominion to his man. It's powerful stuff. It's a very important difference. Now, when we compare Genesis 1 with these other creation accounts, there are some similarities. And I think they're important to point out and it's important to explain why they exist. You have a similar view of a flat earth or a flat like earth. I think the language in the Bible is pretty vague, but we can tell that a lot of ancient societies thought that the earth was flat. There's also a similar view of waters above and below or creation emerging out of chaotic waters. That sort of motif is very common in different creation stories, including what we see in Genesis 1. Uh, you also have similar views of a solid dome above the earth. That's just ancient cosmology. They just they thought that the sky was suspended by this dome, that there was waters above the sky, the sky dome. And that's how rain came down and all that. So. Anyway, they have these explanations for things that fit that ancient worldview. But does this mean that we have to believe these things? No. It doesn't mean that these things are scientifically accurate. It just means that ancient people believed them. God didn't have to feel the need to correct them on their poor understandings of science. This is the vocabulary they had. This was the thought world that they grew up in. And God worked within that to give them what they needed to know at that time. But we don't have to commit ourselves to these things just because it seems like the Bible might lead us that way with the vocabulary and the terminology it uses. It was using the vocabulary and terminology that was available at that time. It's a really, really important point. Now, in light of our own biases as modern people that come to this text with science just in us, no matter how hard we try, I want to ask a question. When I say earth, what comes to mind? And I want you to take a moment, close your eyes. Those of you that are watching this later, please humor me, close your eyes. When I say the word earth, what comes to mind? I submit to you that many of you probably thought this. This is not what an ancient Hebrew would have thought when they heard the word earth, Eretz. This is something that we have recently because of our modern technology and our modern science. This is what an ancient Hebrew would have thought of when you said the word earth. When it says God created the heavens and the earth, this is the earth that they would have known. It's the land, the land where they grew crops, the land where they collected water, the land where they raised their families. This is the earth to an ancient Hebrew. To close, I want to point out some Questions that we ask of Genesis 1, and I want us to reflect on whether we think the original audience would have thought anything about any of these things. How old is the universe? How old is the earth? It's not on their radar. How did plants live without the sun for a few days? Again, they wouldn't have even worried about that. Where did the light come from if the sun wasn't there? They're not concerned with any of that stuff. And so it's really important for us as we approach this important text of Genesis 1, for us to remember what comes to us from our scientific modern perspective and what comes out of the text itself. And we have to keep those two things separate. It doesn't mean that the Bible doesn't say anything about science, because I think it does. I think it says something possibly about science. But we don't need to let our scientific questions about Genesis 1 override the primary questions we should be asking about the text. And the primary questions we should be asking about the text are the same questions that the original audience would have asked. Who is this God that created everything?
That brings this episode to a close. What'd you think? Come on over to restitudio.org and find episode 459, part two of our scripture and science class called Background on Genesis 1, and leave your feedback there. Speaking of feedback, both on restitudio.org and on Facebook, we did a follow-up discussion of our last episode, which is only available on YouTube. So if you want to check out the Restitudio YouTube channel, you'll be able to get that there. And we're hoping to do that uh, as much as possible, hopefully for each of these episodes. We'll see how it goes. You know, life can sometimes get pretty busy. But uh, we're hopeful that we'll be able to have follow-up discussions and even feature some of your feedback and questions in those. So uh, stay tuned for that. If you haven't yet listened to it, go check out YouTube for the follow-up discussion, unedited, talking about the background and why Will approached this class the way he did. And I asked him some of the questions that others are also thinking. So check that out. Thanks, everybody, for listening. If you'd like to support Restitutio, you can do that online at restitutio.org. We'll see you next week. And remember, the truth has nothing to fear.